That's it. So, um, Andy, it's wonderful that you could um, take the time to, to, to come, and, come and join us on this. Um, I'm really looking forward to your, your presentation on business and sustainability and what comes next. So I think it's time for me to get out of the way and over to you. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, well, yeah, I'm Andy. Uh, nice to virtually meet you all. Um, so Peter asked me to give a talk on this particular topic, and it's fair to say that I've kind of gone off topic a little bit, um, but I'm hoping I'll be able to um, give you a bit of an insight into business and sustainability and um, the sort of issues that I come across. So my first job in sustainability I managed to work out was um, 19 years ago um, which makes me feel terribly old um, and it's been pretty challenging uh, quite exhausting and probably a little bit exhilarating into the bargain as well um, and it's been hard bloody slog to be honest business and sustainability is a hard sell over the years and um, yeah, it's been a tough marketplace, but in the last couple of years, there's definitely been a change in how sustainability has been seen within business. So 2019 was probably a key year in terms of, um, I, I was part of it, but we did the Extinction Rebellion March on London, um, Greta Thunberg striking, and I suppose a era of purpose being embedded into business for um, what felt like the first time. Then along came the great pause. So I'm talking to you today from um, my study in my house, which I'm imagining many of you are um, listening in from home. Um, and then I suppose what follows now and will sustainability quite have the same impact that it was um, having pre-COVID? Um, and it's a, a question I um, obviously don't know the answer to, and I'm going to duck quite heavily. Um, but I was around for the last recession in 2008, and that definitely had an impact in terms of what we were working on in terms of sustainability um, and how critical that could be. I suppose the bit that people are hopeful of now is that whether this new era could um, usher in um, a new normal. So obviously trending in my area, um, certainly in sustainability terms, is definitely hash back, build back better and how we rethink supply chains and how we make business more sustainable. Um, and I suppose there's an element of um, how do we carry that forward. But what I want to talk to you about instead is that from my perspective, I don't see sustainability as a trend. It's not like, um, you know, avocado in your sandwich. Is it going to be in this year and out in the next? It's a paradigm shift. Um, but within that, business still needs leading. So what I wanted to do is give a quick whistle-stop tour of my idea around the evolution of sustainability. Um, so I thought I'd better start off with a kind of Milton Friedman-esque kind of profit only so company uh, exists only for short-term shareholder profit um, certainly when i started my career um, that was very much focused around legal compliance and philanthropy so i traveled the world doing compliance audits and making sure that factories adhered to legal requirements and from a philanthropy perspective it was very much passive donations um, you'd bung a charity a few quid when they asked for it that kind of evolved um, into what I'd probably call an era of environmental management. So it was very much about defensive, um, about risk management, about pollution prevention, about waste and energy and resource efficiency. And then that kind of grew. Um, so I went from being an environmental manager to a, uh, a CSR manager, so corporate and social responsibility. And I think that was an improvement. It was definitely more um, aligned with values, but I suppose in that there was still potentially um, the negative side of that would be around um, cause marketing and potentially even um, greenwash. And I suppose the, the key point there was, can we outworthy our competitors? Hopefully we've moved on from that and we're probably into an era now of sustainable business where 
what we try and do is not be a separate sustainability team, but to actually integrate sustainability into core business functions. Um, so ultimately the best sustainability team would be no sustainability team because you've just made it business as usual. And I suppose finally, there's the piece about purpose um, where really what we're talking about is socially aware business that is taking a challenge that society has and trying to create some societal value as part of it. And there's a lot of it about pre-COVID. Um, purpose was everywhere, definitely the new buzzword. Um, and I suppose from being at the margins of business, sustainability professionals started to um, get asked some really serious questions about what is the future of our organisation and how do we take this forward. Um, and I suppose that brand purpose piece, depending on your business, is really important, but it defines um, what you do, how you do it, but most importantly, why you do it, why you exist and the social value that the business wants to create. Um, but I suppose having a core cool purpose is great, maybe more for brands than core business. We'll um, have to see. I suppose there are bigger businesses, a Unilever might disagree, that are trying to embed purpose in what they do. Um, but it must be backed up by some, some action. It can't just be about words. And action really isn't easy. So what I thought I'd share with you is... Um, some way and experience kind of three groups of objections that I probably have heard throughout my career in terms of um, issues that are put forward as to why we can't do a certain sustainability initiative. The first one definitely it's not our problem. Um, I often hear we can't afford to have values, our competitors don't do this, consumers don't care. It's always someone else's fault as to why we can't make a change. Um, and often it is, yeah, our competitors don't do this. So if we do this, we will be disadvantaging ourselves as a business. Um, and a lot of it is about the scale of that change is so big, we just can't get our heads around it. It's too difficult. Therefore, we'll just carry on as business as usual. The next one is probably an improvement on that, but still equally problematic in that society is demanding more from business than ever before, but we don't know where to start. Still an issue as in where do we start? And then finally, I suppose a piece around, we know we need to act, but we can't translate strategy into action. So what do we do? And I do hear that a lot. People are dead keen. You've managed to convert them, but they just want to be told exactly what to do. And that's probably where Indiana Jones comes in. So when I was a kid, all I wanted to be when I grew up was an explorer, an adventurer, just like Indy. And I do appreciate that many of you on this call may be so young that you have no idea who Indiana Jones is, but um, bear with me. Um, and if you get a chance, the movies are amazing. Um, so I wanted to discover things, lost treasures, seek thrills. Um, I even wanted his cool leather bag and I did manage to get one at some point. Um, and I was seriously close to doing archeology span at university. But when I was considering my options and I'm visiting unis, I got hooked on a new subject at the time. Um, so this was back in 1997. Um, and I ended up studying environmental science, which was new. At the time, uh, there was hardly anywhere doing it. It was pretty cool. Um, you got to do some amazing field trips and it was all about saving the world. So I was pretty hooked from, from that point on. Um, post uni, I went traveling to Africa, trying to get a little bit more adventure again. And then finally came back to get a proper job as an environmental consultant. And as I said, that was 19 years ago. So I'm no academic genius it is fair to be said and I draw on no peer-reviewed papers but um, well maybe a little bit of a John Cotter kind of eight-step change model potentially but what I thought I'd do is share with you all a little bit about what I've learned along the way in terms of how to integrate sustainability into business. 
So it doesn't get more exciting than this from the slide perspective, I'm afraid, guys, but you have to bear with me. So number one, know where you're heading. Um, definitely business needs a North Star. It needs leading. Um, you really do need to point people um, in the right direction and paint a picture of what an alternative reality looks like, what that vision looks like, and then keep repeating and repeating it. Um, there are always cynics and doubters, and the vision really does help with that um, clarity direction um, of, I suppose, of the change, what you're expecting. Um, and it really does help decision making in a business, especially if you've got your vision in bloody great big letters on the wall behind you. It, it actually does help drive decision making. Number two, a bit of a Peter Druckerism, um, but culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and I suppose what I mean by this is that it doesn't matter how great your plan is or how elaborate your strategy, its success is completely held back by people if the culture doesn't exist to support it. Um, and I've been definitely hampered by that in the past. If the business is being driven down a low quality, mass produced efficiency for the last 30 years, and you come along with your trendy vision, um, that's not going to be overcome enough to overcome the inertia within the organisation. And it's really hard to fight against that with just your vision. Um, I've seen this with examples of businesses with really famous sustainability programs that win loads of awards, but who failed to do the basic thing of getting the message to the right people. Um, so within that, I've seen senior buyers who are responsible for really the output of the organization who've been there for over 10 years, um, who'd never been trained in the sustainability program or what it meant for them. Um, um, the key issue there was that they'd never been set a KPI. So the CEO might have been shouting from the top of the rafters about how important sustainability is. But from a buyer's perspective, it wasn't in their KPI. And if it wasn't something they were being measured against, it obviously wasn't important. The next one's probably my favourite, actually. Um, you have to fire up a really broad church of followers. Um, this is a quote from a great TED talk from a guy called Derek Sivers um, on how to start a movement. And if you haven't seen it, it's about a really uninhibited guy dancing like a crazy thing at a festival. Um, and he's having so much fun um, just on his own dancing. Um, and people are laughing at him a little bit. He looks a bit crazy. Um, but then one guy gets up and starts to copy what he's doing. And he's the first follower. And it's that first follower that transforms a lone nut into a leader, someone to follow. Um, and I have definitely been that lone nut in several organisations. Um, and I suppose the key thing there is that you um, are able to um, find those first followers and encourage them. And uh, yeah, turn yourself uh, from the lone nut into a leader. Number four. We're about halfway through, bear with me. So when the ground moves, adjust your footing. Um, I suppose what I mean by this is, think about an analogy of a sports coach moving teams. Um, just because you had success with one system um, at one club doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work at the next. Um, I suppose that's a cultural piece as well. Very much it's uh, about what you find on the ground when you get there. Um, so I've got a basic playbook of things that I need to see and develop from a sustainability perspective, but I've learned to change that quite drastically depending on the organisation and make sure that it fits the culture of the organisation you're moving to. Number five, focus on what matters. So um, often sustainability programmes look to change what's easy and not necessarily what matters. Um, ultimately, I've seen this as just business loves progress. So if you're just successfully ticking stuff off a list, people think you're amazing and they rarely challenge you. Um, it doesn't even matter if those things are relevant or necessary. It's just the fact that you're doing something is great, even if it's completely pointless. Um, an example I've seen of this recently is from an airport declaring a net zero carbon budget. Um, but that target 
was scoped to include only their own operations. So um, effectively the running of an airport terminal, but not the planes flying from it, um, which just seems completely pointless to me. Um, but again, yeah, focus on um, what's important. I suppose there's also a point here in terms of burnout and um, the fact that sustainability programs are often huge change programs within organizations and it's really really easy to get completely swept along by that and um, swept under i suppose um, it can be too much um, and i've certainly found that in my career as well that um, you can do too much and you can suffer as a consequence so i suppose there's a balance piece there in terms of making sure there's a little bit of life left in it for you as well number six show don't tell um, so there are always people that you need to convince senior leaders who just don't get it. Um, they spent their whole lives thinking about the pursuit of profit pretty much at any cost and preaching isn't going to work. Showing does more often than not. Um, telling stories can work. Talk, talking about individuals affected by supply chains and what too cheap really does look like. I've managed to do this in the past where um, I wanted a business, I work in the food industry, to make a difference on food waste. Um, but I was struggling to get the level of engagement I needed. So um, I'd managed to get a key customer to get involved in a food waste workshop. And I managed to get my board involved by saying that I'd got a key customer involved. Um, I only got the customer because I told them that my CEO was brought in. And I only got my CEO because I told them a key customer was brought in. So uh, I, I always find that a few white lies help grease the tracks a little bit. But what we did was effectively take that group of people to, um, to see where our food waste was being generated, to then go to charities and see what impact that food surplus was having when we distributed it. And it made a massive difference. They were able to talk to people who were affected and impacted um, and just being able to have that visibility really lifted the agenda. And it meant that we were able to have a much bigger impact when it got back to work. Number seven, breaking down silos. So um, it's surprising how many people have absolutely no idea about the business that they work in. All they know is their department and their job and what they have to do, but they don't understand how their job contributes to something bigger. And I suppose that's a privilege of working in sustainability that you do get to see all of an organization. Um, but I suppose in that you also get to see the problems that are created by that silo mentality of working in departments um, and not understanding the impacts that your actions necessarily have on others throughout and i suppose it's really important to forget who's responsible for what in that and instead create some kind of um, level of um, collective endeavor finally number eight um, get existing people to think differently so i suppose what i mean by this is business folk in mainstream functions are inherently suspicious of the soft world of sustainability and to make progress you really need to be able to um, speak their language and adjust yours and understand their priorities basically you have to be a corporate chameleon um, this takes a massive amount of time and resilience. Sustainability is really hard to do. And pretty much the majority of the time, you have to be the happiest person in the room, full of positivity, able to take knockbacks left, right and centre. That comes with the territory. Um, and you need to be more positive, more resilient, and I suppose more professional than, uh, than those around. which leads me all the way back to Indiana. And I suppose the point there is that um, from a sustainability professional perspective, working in the industry, you're constantly creating change, moving uphill, trying to sell what it is that you do. It's a lot of hard work. Um, it's probably not quite as sexy as the movies. It's not quite at the cutting edge it's not quite forging new frontiers moving at high speeds overcoming obstacles that is a bit of a myth um i never got my whip or my leather hat uh, i did get the bag admittedly um but i suppose i do really love what i do 
Um, and if you work hard in this field in sustainability, which is changing just so, so fast, um, you do get to create your own adventure. That's it, Peter. Did, is anyone there still? Are you still there, Peter? Do you want to ask me some questions? We are, we are definitely still here. That was, that, was, that was fantastic. Thank you very much, Andy. I'm going to put this on so I can see you. Oh no, you don't, you don't have to. You don't have to do that. The um, um, no, that was wonderful. That was um, that that was really good. And uh, and, and and sadly, I recognise this person that you've got on the screen. <laughs> it's an films. age thing. It's an age thing. <laughs> um, we we we've, we've got some um, questions lined up, so I will um, put those um, to you now. And um, for for um, for for. The, those attending, you're welcome to ask questions um, at any point. So just keep your questions coming. I will try and batch them up, Andy, to, to, to make some sense. I'm, I'm, I might not always do that, um, but let's let's see how we go. Um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the questions in the in the chat, and then, and then I'll, I'll read them out. So um, if if you didn't hear what I said, then uh, it's it's there to remind you. Um, first question was on um, circular economy. Um, and uh, in that sort of, it's not our problem. Um, do you feel that the circular economy is a is a way to to to, to tackle some of that and, and and really break through some some really good ideas? Um, and for those not familiar, um, one person's uh, cast off or waste is, is somebody else's treasure that they can use and, and, and use uh, um, to take the value from. So, so Andy, um, yeah, I do. I. I think it's quite specific. I don't think it's going to solve all the problems, but I think it's very suitable to certain industries and certain products that um, lend itself to that model. So um, I suppose the obvious one, really obvious would be like milk bottles, but I think you can apply that circular thinking to lots of products. Um, but at the same time, there's lots that you can't apply that to. So I know um, from a supermarket perspective, that model's, um, one that they're exploring much more. It happens in France a lot more where um, you go and fill up your containers yourselves or you even get a delivery to your door, but it fills up your containers rather than relying on, on packaging. Um, but it's not suitable for every product. Um, the business I work in at the moment is um, food manufacturing, but very much food to go. So sandwiches and sushi and stuff like that. So model that really doesn't work in in that field and i suppose without wanting to be too controversial um the world is not all about packaging we've gone a bit packaging mad and um with good reason things are over packaged but when you look at the really big picture um packaging is not quite as evil as we necessarily make it out to be um, and there are certainly some bigger issues so um yeah, you don't want to be blinded by one issue on its own and really take a holistic view. I've got a question about what you do all day. So what's your routine? What's what do you day? do? <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I get that asked a lot. <laughs> what do my team do? Yeah, what, what do you do? What, what does your team do? So, you know, is, is there a pattern that you uh, that people can draw from here? Um, the, I suppose there's a split. So, um, there's a difference between being a technical function. So we have, um, certain areas to manage from a risk perspective. So, um, within my team, there will be a human rights team who look at, um, human rights risk and modern slavery risk within the supply chain. There'll be a sustainable sourcing element of the team in terms of looking at the supply chain again, but rather than a human rights risk, a sustainability risk. So where is their drought? Where are we? Where are the carbon hotspots? Um, then there's a certification piece in terms of we are selling sustainable fish um, certified to MSC or certified palm oil or certified soya. And how do we keep track of that? Um, and that's one part of it. I suppose the much bigger part is then what is the strategy of the organization? How do we measure ourselves against that strategy? How do we embed sustainability into other business departments that 
um, my whole point around the best sustainability team is no sustainability team. So we're trying to build it into other departments like procurement. Um, communications, I'd probably spend, well, I was going to say half, certainly a lot of my time communicating to other organisations, to stakeholders, to investors, to customers about what we're doing on sustainability um, and how we're making a difference. So, yeah, much more varied role than um, it used to be, I suppose. Another question on um, checklists. So um, th this was about what does your, your checklist look like that um, um, you know, referred to um, and what are you looking for? And then an add-on question to that. Um, um, do you think that globalisation is, is contributing to lack of sustainability? So there's a split question there. Um, they are not answer, related answer in one. any way, Peter. You've done a terrible job there. They're not... <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. So I think the first one was that about me talking about sports teams and about moving. I think okay. so. Yeah. I think so, so I suppose I was talking about my playbook um, and it's, it wouldn't necessarily be a for sustainability playbook. It would be kind of, um, I'd want to make sure there was really great governance. So um, I'd want board level support. I'd want CEO support. I'd want a, stru a tiered structure of, um, what does governance look like? Who's accountable? Who's responsible? Um, effectively, so you're managing non-financial KPIs with the same level of surety as you are managing financial KPIs. Um, I'd want some kind of vision, some kind of strategy. It's really important to have that in terms of a guiding principle. I suppose I'm coming back to the eight things I've just talked to you about. Um, I'd also really want to build relationships so you've got to understand who those key people are in the organization that make stuff happen um, and have those relationships with those guys in terms of understanding how the business works and i suppose linking to that would be you've got to have some quick wins um, you've got to be able to convince people pretty early on that um, there is a change and this is what the change looks like what was the second part of the question? Because it bared no resemblance. To the yeah, first. no, it didn't actually. I copied too much there. The um, I, I don't know whether you want to hold that until there's there's other ones like that, or whether you can you can answer it now about about the, the globalization and sustainability. Are they compatible? Is, is one undermining the other? Is one undermining the other? I suppose there's an in there's a piece on COVID as well and building back better and. Um, food systems thinking i suppose um by which i mean are things going to get more localized as a result and are supply chains too stretched um it's difficult when it comes to sustain local doesn't mean better when it comes to sustainability um just because produce is growing down the road does not mean that there isn't human rights abuses still going on or doesn't actually mean that the environmental impact is any less it's it's too difficult to and too complex to try and turn arguments into really simple sound bites even though i've just turned a load of things into really simple sound bites for this talk but generically it's too way too complex um is globalization the problem when it comes to um not necessarily i don't i think that would be way too simplistic i think it's you can still have global supply chains and be sustainable it's about how you do it it's about um ultimately food is too cheap i work in the food industry food is way too cheap um in terms of percentage of our income it's tiny now and it's about i'm going to make up some numbers now but i've, I've got a feeling it's about 10 percent of income now that we spend on food whereas pre-war it was more like half um, it, and I've really made up those numbers. I've got no idea. Don't, don't quote me on that. Um, whatever it was, it's a massive, massive proportional change. And it just means we don't value food in the same way. But at the same time, we've got people who can't afford food um, and are visiting food banks on a regular basis, um, even though they're in work because they just can't simply afford to feed their family. So we've got this really, really split food system in the UK um, and one problem doesn't answer the other no oh, thank you thank you i'm, I'm going to try and give, give you a, um, a, a, co a coherent question rather than my bad um, separation of, uh, of of questions here um, on tools what what tools um are you getting are you, are you using to 
to to get people to think differently and and if you've got any specific covid or post covid advice around that but what, what sort of tools is tools it, tools um i suppose there's the kind of a boring geeky answer around um how we would you know we've got tools on how do you do a human rights risk assessment um or how do you show the impact of sustainability throughout a value chain and how do you measure that um but i suppose the widest sense of tools um uh there's a lady called solitaire townsend who works for a, a comms agency in london called futera who do a lot about sustainability comms and solitaire always says sustainability communications is all about logic and magic and i completely buy into that in that um whenever you're making an argument whenever you're doing a presentation um you have to have the numbers you have to have the logic you have to have the business background but unless it's got the magic it doesn't cut through and if you just have the magic without any of the logic again you're just telling a nice story so always always logic plus magic i'm not sure that counts as a tool but i'm having it I'm going to go random now. So, um, oh, good. I, 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 I've pushed a question further down. So, I'm going to ask you about tourism. So, um, depending on how much you, you can add to the, the tourism side, what would you consider the future of sustainability in the tourism industry beyond environmental actions? Um, in some ways, you, you, you referenced about um, airports before, but. Um, yeah i well i think it's i think there's a lot changing and there'll be a lot changing a lot faster due to covid um and people thinking about how to run businesses differently as a result um and a lot of people going out of business as a result um whether that will change the global tourism industry um i probably yeah uh, i'm not sure i'd be um expert enough to have an opinion on that but i would certainly see a return certainly in the short term to um more localized british holidays i'm going on holiday to north wales very nice part of the world very nice absolutely um becoming more linked on the questions it's a it's a, it's a large um, organization question um and it's um, what can large organisations like Greencore, Nestle, anybody else you'd care to name, um, uh, who uh, take um, sustainability seriously, how can they help promote that with SMEs? And then I've got an SME uh, question coming up as well. Uh, how can we, pre I, well, it depends on the definition of the question. Um, I suppose we can do that quite directly with SMEs in terms of our supply chain. So bigger companies have smaller companies that supply them. Um, and therefore we can embed that within our procurement processes and um, within specific agreements in our T's and C's in how we engage with people. Um, often there's an issue throughout created throughout the whole supply chain. So a lot of it is with cost again is with, um, we will you know myths like the consumer will only pay x for this product therefore you've just got to um make it work um yeah so there are rules of the game that can be constrained and sometimes you need to try and break those rules of the game so um certainly from a retailer perspective you start thinking about well if you're only setting one year contracts then the manufacturer only has a one-year contract then we only give a one-year contract to our suppliers and our suppliers only give a one-year contract to the farmer and if the farmer wants to invest in anything in a bigger slurry tank in a bigger water storage device in a um, stop runoff from the fields to um, install renewable um, electricity you can't do those things you can't go to a bank with a one-year contract so how do we ensure that throughout the supply chain you start to get five or ten year contracts that mean that people can invest and i don't have an answer to that sounded good to me um now we now we go small so this is um what would you say to a smaller micro business who can't employ maybe somebody like your, yourself 
but it's got to approach um, sustainability. Um, where would be a good place to start? And this question comes from the, the, the building industry, but I, I think this is a, a general challenge for small organizations. Who, who, uh, where does the leadership come from? Um, I suppose there's a couple of different angles to that. So one would always be know where your impact is and concentrate on that. So if you know if you listed out the top 10 sustainability impacts of your business don't be Heathrow Airport and try and hit number nine um, go for numbers one two and three um, so yeah don't just start um, banning straws from the canteen or um, uh, making sure you've got recycled paper in the printer that's kind of not really where we're at it's thinking about what impacts does your business have and how do you challenge those and i suppose the whole point about purpose and business purpose is about how do you have a greater good what is the purpose of your business beyond making a profit what social good are you trying to solve um what value do you give back to society and i think that's a an interesting lens to view things through how you do that as an sme as a, as a micro business where do you get that level of um expertise from um happens all the time it come it often comes from creative entrepreneurs from business leaders from um engaged owners who um are trying to figure this out and they don't always get it right um you can get it quite spectacularly wrong but i think getting it wrong is better than not trying i'm going to ask you some career questions now so the, the first one is which, which um the sectors have you worked in other than the food industry have you is it all been food industry or is it um been wrong? I've got um, wrong. pretty much so i've been in the food industry for i'm gonna say 15 of those 19 years um, and the food industry is a really weird industry. Someone asked me this question earlier on today, actually, um, if it's a good industry. And it's the sort of industry that um, there's two sorts of people. There's people who join it and stay for life. And there's people who join it and leave immediately um, because it is very different. It is incredibly fast pace. And that pace dictates a lot of culture and behavior as a result. And a lot of people just can't handle it. It's just not. Um, what suits um, but before that I was a consultant so I looked at many different businesses so um, a lot of them kind of heavy pollution so I, I looked at um, car industry a lot actually in terms of um, automotive manufacturing but pretty much always manufacturing of some kind or another was that all of your question no, no. Well, there's a second. No, I, I don't mean yeah. question. I meant that particular oh, question. Oh, yes. Today. Yeah, no, I think I think it was. Um, so the next one is taking you back a, a, a bit further. You, you're talking about um, early, earlier part of your career. If you go even further back, um, you, you went from environmental science. How, how did you make that? Uh, or where did you get your uh, knowledge to make that jump? Uh, jump from where? Oh, sorry, jump from your environmental science um, start of the career yep. to, to where you are now. Um, you, you, so, you started doing certain jumps along the way. Yeah, I was quite lucky, actually. So, um, yeah, the kind of whole environmental sector was just starting off um, when I was at uni. It wasn't really a thing before that. It was um, part of kind of engineering consultancies before that. And it was this new thing that we weren't really sure about. And it was the sort of industry that you needed three years experience to get into. But where do you get three years experience from? But um, I actually was really lucky in that my lecturer at university um, ran a, his own consultancy business and came into university to lecture one day a week. Um, and he liked me and or maybe just felt sorry for me, but gave me a job. Um, and so, yeah, when I got back from traveling, I got a job with him. Um, it was only for a brief period, but it was enough to get on my CV that um, I'd done that. And then I was able to move on and move um, on to another consultancy role. And then I suppose it's just expanded and expanded. So um, in business, if you're good at stuff and you manage stuff well, you just get more stuff. 
people just chuck stuff at you. Um, so yeah, you just get add-ons. You're like, well, you're doing all that and you're doing a good job. So can you, you could just do this as well, can't you? Yeah, go cool. on, be fine. So I, I oh, pressed the wrong return key there. Um, I've got some a question on communications that I've just put up and then I've got a couple of um, COVID um, sort of continuity and lux luxurious uh, ideas about um, the luxury of um, sustainability coming up. But this one's about communications. Any communication techniques you'd recommend to, to keep people on side, inspire change? Um, I'm sure, I, surely we touched on that during the tour. You just live up pearls of wisdom. So um, yeah, I suppose I'm probably one of, not this one is not a demonstration of it. This was not what I do normally. This is storytelling, but um, my my skills with PowerPoint are probably top echelon. I, I do virtually everything I do is in a presentation. Um, because effectively you're always trying to communicate a message in some case or other. Um, so I suppose you've got to have communications at different levels. Um, you've got to have that really big picture stuff, that the vision, the direction, the where are we heading. Um, but I, there's different types of people within organisations and I'm someone who's very creative, very big picture. Um, I need to know the strategy. I hate people telling me what to do. I can't stand it. Um, uh, I hate tasks, completely hate tasks. Whereas I'll go and talk to other teams and you go and talk to a team of accountants about creativity and strategy. And they look at you as if to say, just, just tell me what to do. Just give me a task and I'll do it, but just don't make me think. So you've got to be able to change that communication style and that message, depending on who you're talking to. I suppose that's the, the key point. And apologies to all accountants out there. I do love you. The, um, I've actually put two questions up because they're, they're so close um, in, um, in, 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 in subject area. Um, both sort of COVID, the, the disruption that we've got. The, the first one's about the constraints about COVID um, and, and, and how do you keep the sustainability strategy going on in the short term? And then the next one is, can it be kept going? Is it going to be perceived as a luxury um, or, or, or can you get around that? So I, mean, I, I don't have the answer, obviously. I personally, I suppose it's, um, I referred to the sustainability is a paradigm shift. It's not a trend. Um, it definitely took a downturn in the last um, recession. There is many a school of thought that says that won't happen this time. Um, there will obviously be a backing off of certain activities in terms of business just won't have the cash. If you're putting people on furlough, you can't really go and spend a load of money on a on a on a program that you're not sure about. Um, so undoubtedly stuff will be impacted in terms of programs, but I, I, I don't see that as a problem as in the direction of travel is being so powerful and so forceful um, with this kind of move to business purpose and about social change and social value that that, that won't be dropped. That is too strong a movement. Um, so there may be a short term six month, maybe 12 month delay in terms of we just can't afford to do that project, but the general direction won't change. I hope not anyway, as I'll be out of a job. Yeah, I've put you under a lot of pressure. I'm going to make this the last formal question because um, we, we, we're, we're getting close to time and I haven't given you much of a breather, Andy, but uh, the last question I want to put formally to you and, and maybe we might have a little bit of time after I formally close, but um, the, the last question I want to put to you is how, how do you go um, further um, on the, into the supply chain and especially to do with sustainable development goals? How do you convince people um, to, in your supply chain to to uh, undertake this and just while you're thinking about this there was a comment I didn't really ask it as a question but somebody commented on about that they look at um, all of the sustainability the SDGs go too many and then they focus on a, on a small number so um, now I've given you a little bit of time to think about it. I'll, I'll yes I mean yeah um, 
I think the SDGs are great in terms of um, giving a, a focus, but there is a hell of a broad focus. So I suppose it's applying it to your organization and figure out which ones are the most important. Um, you can't have 17 areas of focus. You kind of, um, you know, business is always about three to land. What three are you going to deliver? Um, it's either three or five. You can't have four. It's just no, not acceptable. Um, so yeah, focus is a big piece. In terms of that supply chain piece, um, I haven't cracked it yet, but there's, there are tools to do that with. There are, um, it's about how you go about doing the convincing. So things like supplier codes of conduct, um, building things into your T's and C's, risk assessment processes, but then it's all about what do you do with that information? So just because you have a risk assessment that says something's high risk, what do you do as a result? So human rights is a great example in terms of um, you find a load of human rights abuses in a factory in your supply chain. What do you do? Do you immediately pull out and just say they're not going to be our supplier anymore? Well, how does that benefit the people that are working in that factory? Um, so from a human rights perspective, the um, the right thing to do the accepted way of acting would be to say no i'm not we're not going to pull out we're going to work with you we um because you are supplying us we have sway over how you run your business therefore we're going to engage with you and force you to improve um and is that a better thing to do than pull out and move to someone else um there are many different ways of being able to engage with the supply chain i think the key thing again is focusing on what's important focusing on those hot spots you you can die trying trying to do everything so for example on kind of a sourcing perspective um, most of the retailers would have a list of their top 30 in green core we're not as big as a retailer we don't have the same product range so we'd say top 10 so what are our top 10 ingredients that we really need to think about and how do we make a difference on them and I suppose I've got a bugbear with data. Um, everyone loves data. Um, and with retailers, it's a real issue that they just want data and they want you to be able to submit data on your supply chain. Um, but data doesn't change anything on its own. And we can get so hung up in sustainability on measuring stuff. I'm not saying measuring is not important. Um, but often there's so much focus on how do we measure this that people don't actually do anything. Um, and for me, it's got to be about doing stuff. And on that bit, if I can ask you just to move on one slide, I just wanted to, to say a formal thank you very much, Andy. Um, so Andy Wright from, from uh, Green Core Group. Uh, that, was, that was wonderful. Th thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and thank you for all the attendees. There's plenty of questions coming through. Sorry, I can keep up. Um, with all of them. And um, Andy, you coped well with my random style of, uh, of, of reordering them and, and passing them across to you. But uh, no, that, that was really appreciated. I, I, we advertised to finish at um, 4.50. I want to formally stop there. Um, so we will carry on the recording. And Andy, if you've got time for one or two more questions, just hang about for five minutes, then that'd be wonderful. Yeah, sure, no problem. Yeah. But, but, you know, no, thank you very much. So um, to, to those people listening, um, you're welcome to stay. I, I was just conscious that I didn't want to, uh, to overrun. Um, but Andy, and yeah, I've got one more question I wanted to put to you. Um, I suspect I know your answer, but I wanted to put it to you anyway. Uh, the, the, the question about um, carbon offsetting, would you encourage it? Would I encourage carbon offsetting? Um... Oh. <sighs> difficult question um there's there's carbon offsetting and then there's carbon offsetting so there's kind of generically no i wouldn't encourage it but there are certain carbon offset programs that are better than others um just in terms of visibility and transparency and you know where are you planting trees or where are you extracting carbon um so it's not quite as simple as good versus bad but um yeah i wouldn't generically no it's not something that um i would be looking at i'd be much more focused on how do you reduce in the first place yeah go about taking action 
measure it, but focus on taking action and, and making sure the action's appropriate and good and, and, and makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. Um, there's, um, do, 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 do. I'm, I'm, if I can keep you just for a couple more minutes, questions just come through um, that um, you'll see in the chat. I'll quickly copy Do you know what? I, I've probably avoided all this because I've not seen any of the chat. I've oh, not put okay. it up. I that's, was worried that fine. if I put it up on my screen, it would be... Um, um, but uh, but I'll, I'll read it out to you anyway. Yeah. Um, um, why does no one talk about biodiversity offsetting? Is the very final one I will I will leave you with, and then uh, I'll let everyone go. Have um, biodiversity offsetting. Yeah. Well, I mean, we definitely talk about biodiversity. Biodiversity would be a material um, for our business and for mm -hmm. many food businesses. So, um, yeah, absolutely would be a, a key issue. Um, I suppose it although it's mentioned a lot it probably is kind of the fourth or fifth thing on the list you know we, yeah. we carbon's probably the thing that attracts the attention and then biodiversity is kind of a bit further down the list but um yeah there's many different ways of looking at that whether it's um from a farming level or from a food security level from a um, i think there's something like only 12 um crops 12 ingredients that are kind of predominantly pretty much everything we eat in a western diet so it's kind of a diversity um uh food security diversity piece as well great stuff 